Hello and welcome to the Nick Lugo Show. I am Nick Lugo and today I have on Dr. George Rebeck and he is going to share with us a little bit of the insights of the neuroscience behind addiction. This is something that I found incredibly, incredibly interesting. And while he talks about how it relates to our everyday lives, you know, how not only are we addicted to cocaine, but we're also addicted to our phones and well, everything. And he describes the underlying mechanisms behind it. So if you're interested in all that stuff, this is something I found incredibly interesting and well, I think you are going to love it. So let's get on to the episode. Yeah, there are a lot of similarities among a lot of the drugs. They all, at least the addictive drugs, they all have common elements and dopamine is one of those things yeah dopamine doesn't act by itself there's a lot of other mechanisms dopamine is more of a a modulator i think of it as a modulator because it sort of allows certain things to happen it doesn't make things happen but it allows things to happen Mm. so for example it might enhance the way that glutamate works glutamate is an important transmitter it's, it's probably the most common transmitter in the brain, at least excitatory transmitter. Somewhere around 50% of all the synapses in the brain use glutamate as a, as a transmitter. Okay. And glutamate's at a powerful excitant, but dopamine sort of allows glutamate to work better so that it can actually drive behavior. And people originally focused on dopamine because it was the first transmitter that could easily be tested and studied. Mm. It was a simple amine and so people could look at it. And so, uh, you know, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, they were the first group of transmitters that really got studied a lot back in the 60s. -hmm. And so there was a lot of emphasis on those transmitters. But we've since learned since the 1960s that there's a lot more going on in the brain than just uh, dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin. And glutamate is one of those things. We didn't know much about glutamate in the 1960s. And so you have to kind of be careful because uh, if you just look at the old literature, you kind of think that dopamine drives everything or norepinephrine or serotonin. Thinking about uh, depression, for example, and psychotic behavior. They focus a lot on the amines, dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin. But as we're finding out now, uh, some of the treatments for depression actually involve uh, ketamine, which is a drug that interferes with glutamate transmission. Hmm. And so the system hmm. is, is a lot more complicated than you might think. And dopamine is an important part of that, but it's not the only part. And all of the drugs that involve some type of addictive mechanism, whether it's alcohol or cocaine or amphetamine or ecstasy, they all have an effect on the dopamine system. But, the, but that in turn has an effect on glutamate, which also affects other transmitters. So it's a complicated process. And that's why there hasn't been very much uh, treatment developed for addiction because it is so complicated. So let, let me take you through a scenario. You know, I think this will be very helpful for <clears throat> my understanding as well as everyone else's understanding. I, there's, there's a common situation that happens where I like to think of, you know, it's Thursday night, you know, you're sitting there and you've been saying, you know what, I haven't really gone to the gym that much. I really need to get started. I haven't worked out in maybe a few months, you know, and I'm starting to gain weight. You kind of take a look and you're like, you know what? I'm going to start going to the gym, right? So we could call that your prefrontal cortex, right? That's you planning. That's your planning aspect of your brain saying, all right, I'm going to get started and I'm going to do it, you know? Then Friday morning comes around or, you know, let's let's say it's the next day and you, you made this incredible plan to start going to the gym to really get started. But your basal ganglia, right? Your dopaminergic centers, everything that's going on inside that we, we could say is determining your action is telling you don't go to the gym don't go to the gym and you end up waking up the next morning and not going to the gym so i'm just wondering you know if you could take us through really what is happening throughout this process inside of our brains and how it relates to yes glutamate dopamine and also you know well the entire brain well i don't know it's a complicated (laughs) issue but you're right i mean prefrontal cortex is involved in a lot of planning 
and forward thinking. Uh, and the basal ganglia help to allow those plans to turn into action. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the information from prefrontal cortex gets routed through the basal ganglia so that you can either act or not act on a particular plan that you might have. Uh, but there's all kinds of factors that will influence that. So, you know, you may wake up in the morning and decide not to do it because, well, I don't know, you, you are hungry and you'd rather eat or you uh, didn't sleep well that night or you have other things going on and you don't want to necessarily go to the gym that day. It's, hmm. it, it's hard to pinpoint any one particular thing. Hmm. And again, just like dopamine, I mean, all the circuits that you have in your brain, including prefrontal cortex, uh, they don't act by themselves. And so prefrontal cortex, like I said, is communicating with the basal ganglia, but the basal ganglia is getting input from the amygdala. The amygdala is sending information to prefrontal cortex. The amygdala plays a role in emotional behavior mm -hmm. and how, how strongly you might desire to go to the gym. And so your neurons in this prefrontal basal ganglia amygdala circuit are all interacting and deciding whether or not, or firing, I guess, since we're talking about neurons, mm -hmm. uh, whether or not they want to become active and, and allow you to do certain things. So, you know, motivation is a very complicated process and yeah. it's influenced by a lot of things. So is addiction. Yeah. I mean, one thing that, that I've been really wondering, you know, and it's, it's been on my mind is when you look at something like, um, like the desire to do multiple things, how much do we know? Let's say I'm desiring between, let's say, eating a sandwich or let's say, let's say playing video games and doing homework, right? So I'm deciding between two. And a lot of that is neuro, uh, neurologically mediated by dopamine and, and glutamate and all of these, all these neurotransmitters. And you ask the question, how does our brain actually decide, or do we know how our brain actually decides between both of the um, activities? Well, I don't think we know at the neuronal level how that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that there are certain areas of the brain that do certain things and somehow they interact and they'll drive a certain behavior. You know, dopamine is important in, in setting a threshold for whether or not a neuron is going to fire or not. Mm -hmm. So in the basal ganglia, for example, a lot of those neurons are very negatively charged. So they don't fire very often mm -hmm. because they're so negative. Well, dopamine helps to bring them up toward threshold, toward the firing point. So then when you get other inputs onto that neuron, it'll now fire. Okay, so you need dopamine kind of to get you started, but dopamine won't push you over the edge. You need something else like glutamate to get you going over the edge. Mm. And, and I imagine the same things are happening in, in other areas of the brain, like prefrontal cortex or amygdala. You need a whole interaction of transmitters to, to set a certain level of excitability in your neurons mm -hmm. so that when other inputs come in, whether you want to eat a sandwich or whether you want to uh, do your homework or play a video game, which one of those inputs might have the stronger influence on that neuron will push it over the th uh, threshold and then you'll do whatever that particular group of neurons wants you to do whether it's play video game or eat a sandwich or do your home. yeah so tell us about some of the research that you've done on this in cocaine and ecstasy and, and alcohol well yeah i mean i think most of what we do uh is in animals mostly in in rats we've done a little bit of work in mice and one of the reasons for that is that uh, rats will take drugs just like people. I mean, they'll, they'll be responsive to taking drugs. And so in some of our experiments, we've had animals that are trained to self-administer a drug like cocaine. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can hook them up with a uh, uh, intravenous catheter in the neck so that whenever they press a lever in a box, that turns on a pump, and the pump is a small cane system. And 
they'll go back to the lever and press again and press again. So they very quickly learn that if they press this lever in the box that they're in, uh, they'll receive a steady supply of cocaine, <laughs> just, like, uh, just like people. And you can look at their behavior over time and they sort of regulate themselves. They don't, they don't overdose. Uh, we have certain um, controls in the system so that they, we prevent them from overdosing. So they can't just sit there and bang on the levers continuously. There's a certain pause between each lever press. But when they do press the lever, they'll take the drug and they'll continue to keep pressing. If we keep them in the boxes for several hours, they'll just keep taking the drug. In fact, if you give them an unlimited amount of time, they'll just keep taking drug all day long and they won't bother to eat or drink. Wow. So, so they, can, they can be pretty much addicted to cocaine. You, you can get similar kinds of responses with alcohol. It's a little harder though with alcohol because you can't, or you have to be careful injecting alcohol IV and no one really takes alcohol IV anyway. Yeah. You have to, you have to take it uh, through the mouth. And so it takes a while for the drug to get into your system and reach the brain. But the same kinds of things happen. And then the same thing happens with ecstasy or, or other drugs. Animals, if they're given the chance, will take these drugs. So why will they do it? Why will they take the drugs? Well, as I said before, there is a change in the dopamine system. All of these drugs will increase dopamine transmission. And if you interfere with dopamine transmission, if you block it, you can block receptors with various drugs that are now available. Uh, you can block the addictive process or you can at least block the, the movements involved in making the response to get your drug. Mm. Um, but that doesn't mean that the animal doesn't want the drug, it may be a being he can't move very well. Yeah. And so there are other things going on too. And so one of the things we've been looking at is, is the glutamate system. And we've been looking at that for a variety of reasons. There's a whole bunch of reasons why you get involved in a particular type of experience. Looking at glutamate, uh, These are the proteins that remove glutamate from the synapse. Because once a transmitter is released, you have to clear it out so you can send another signal. Okay. And dopamine has transporters, uh, glutamate has transporters. So these are molecules in the synapse that clear the transmitter out for the next signal. Well, it turns out that the glutamate transporters are very critical for this addictive kind of uh, response. And if you uh, interfere with that transporter, you can interfere with the uh, with addiction. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing we've been most interested in is relapse, because that's the big problem with addiction. Yeah, people always go back, they, they stop, they claim it's over with. But after a few days or a few weeks, or even a few months, they'll get hooked again, they'll relapse. And rats will do the same. And what's critical exporters that are involved in, in, in regulating glutamate transmission because over time, those transporters increase expression. So there's more and more of them. And so if you block those transporters, you can interfere with relapse, you could actually prevent relapse. So the way we test it in rats, every time they press for cocaine, for example, mm -hmm. there'll be a tone or some kind of cue that goes with their injection of cocaine. Mm -hmm. So they get cocaine, they get a cue, cocaine, they get a cue, cocaine, they get a cue. And after several days of that, we then stop giving them the cocaine. We just sort of put them on a, uh, a cycle where they don't have access to the drug anymore. So they're uh, during a period of uh, abstention from the drug. Mm -hmm. And then after a few days of that, when they stop responding, we give them just the cue. Mm -hmm. And they'll go to the lever and start pressing, even though they're not getting cocaine anymore, they're just responding to the cue. And the same <laughs> thing happens in addicts. If you take them away from the drug or if they're away from the drug for a while and then suddenly give them cues associated with the drug, like with cocaine, it might be powder, pictures of white powder, people, pictures of people in, inhaling cocaine or yeah. 
pictures of uh, people that are uh, injecting drugs. Or just like the room. Yeah. Things that are associated with uh, taking, taking a drug. And it, it, it increases their craving. All of a sudden, they want the real thing now. And yeah. the same thing is true with rats. You give them this cue, and suddenly they'll start pressing or trying to get the real drug. And you can block that effect by interfering with the, with the glutamate transporter. It, it's got a technical name, but it's abbreviated as GLT-1. Mm -hmm. it, it's one of the primary transporters glutamate in the brain. And so if we interfere with that, we can block this response to the cue. And we've tried, well, people have tried it in, in humans, but it's, it's hard to go from a rat to a human right away. Yeah. Because humans have all kinds of reasons for taking a drug. With a rat, there's only one reason. You give it to the rat. <laughs> humans have other choices, right? I mean, you can do other things. You don't have to just sit there and take a drug. You can go out and drive your car. You can play a video game. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. And so there are different choices involved for humans. But the same mechanisms are involved. It's just a little harder to study in humans. So if you give some of these drugs that interfere with uh, glutamate transmission, uh, you can also interfere with some uh, craving for alcohol in humans. Uh, there's been some studies for that that have been done, not very many. We, we did a little study in, in our department with some humans that were uh, 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 alcoholics, or that were defined as alcoholics because of their craving for alcohol. Mm -hmm. And we found that the, the level of glutamate, the overall level of glutamate, if you measure it using MRI in the brain, is, is higher in those people, which would suggest that there is a problem with how glutamate is regulated. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's possible you could, you could try to interfere in human addiction with, with a glutamate drug that interferes with that transporter. But like I said, it's a little more complicated in humans because there are other things that could be involved there. There are other things they may want to do. And so it's, it's, it's a little more difficult. But in rats, it's a relatively simple uh, system that, that we've been able to delineate. And so we hope we're at, at some point we'll be able to move along and be able to treat human addiction a little bit better. So how... Um how strong are the results for it? So for example, you give them, right, you give them cocaine that activates their glutamate um, system, and then you give them the drug that deactivates their glutamate receptors. How effective is it? Do they still take the cocaine or do they completely throw it off and decide not to take it at all? The, the, in rats, the drug that interferes with glutamate will block the relapse response. Mm -hmm. Completely. Yes. But, wow. it won't, but it won't block the initial taking of the drug, okay? So mm -hmm. when rats are first put in the box, mm -hmm. and they find out if they press the lever and they get a shot of cocaine, they'll continue to press the lever even if you interfere with their glutamate system. So glutamate's not involved in that initial taking. Yeah. But it is involved in establishing this uh, memory, if you will, between the drug and the surroundings or the cue associated with the drug. So that's where the glutamate system comes in. And it's, you know, it, it, it's one of many systems that are involved and relapse is a big problem with addiction. So, you know, it may be that, that the liking response or the, the liking of the drug is initially a dopamine mediated kind of thing. And then other things come into play once you're continuing to take the drug and then you know, eventually glutamate and, and relapse become an important thing. Well, it's, it's an interesting idea. So what, what you said was that there's very little choices that rats have, but at the same time, humans have a lot of choices. So, you know, unfortunately, addiction has not been treated very well in, right. for in, in humans, right? We haven't really cracked the code on addiction. I, I hear stories all the time about people from my high school dying from heroin addictions and relapsing and all these things that are absolutely awful. And a lot of that has to deal with the fact that humans are not in control, in, especially in the form of addiction. You know, sometimes 
someone who's addicted, right? You ask the question, if they're addicted, do they have control over whether or not they're going to take the heroin, cocaine, alcohol, whatever? And the answer is a most likely not. Yeah. So, so it seems like the answer could be found in what you're talking about is what neuropharmacology, right? And taking drugs. So do you think that's where the future lies? Well, yeah, I think that's, that's where a lot of it will lie. I think that, uh, you know, initially, even the decision to take drugs involves a lot of different choices. Mm -hmm. And there, for one thing, one reason some people will start taking drugs is peer pressure. You know, if all your friends or the people in your group are taking drugs, then you feel a lot of pressure to go along with them. So that's a factor. I mean, rats don't have that peer pressure. Hmm. And so there, there's a number of reasons why humans might start taking a drug. But once you start getting on that cycle, I guess, or, or wheel, you, you just kind of keep going. And then certain changes happen in the brain that are very similar to what's happening in rats. And so it, it's useful to get on this pathway to try to figure out what's going on in the brain, but there, there, there's a long way to go. Yeah. There's a long way to go. Another thing that, that influences even rats and whether they take the drug is how they're brought up, hmm. is, is their environment. So most rats in an experimental situation in a lab live in a, in a small cage. There may be a few little things in there that keep them active. But that's about it. They don't have too many things to do during the course of a day. But if you put them in a, in a chamber where there's a lot of things to do, where there's other rats, where there's uh, tunnels to run through and, and uh, things uh-huh. on the floor where they can dig tunnels and uh, climb ladders and do all kinds of stuff, they're less, it, it, it's harder for those rats to start taking the drug. And then eventually they'll start taking cocaine too but it's much more difficult to get them started. Mm. So it seems as though their brains have developed in a little bit different way. They're more resistant or resilient to uh, being led into uh, an addictive process. Interesting, yeah. I mean, so what you just described, that's Rat Park, correct? Yeah. Rat Park, yeah. So one of the things that I thought was really interesting, what that's called is it's Rat Park, where, you know, like the the rats get to have as much fun, as much stimulation as possible. One of the things that I found was most interesting is that um, is that we actually use these drugs all the time for that exact purpose. So if you look at somebody with ADH, uh, ADD, right, attentional deficit disorder, and um, the problem with people with ADD is that they don't have enough dopamine, they don't have enough norepinephrine, and what ends up happening is that they actually need that stimulus, so they're, they're unstimulated, they need some stimulation to actually start paying attention, and that's why they take Adderall, for example, I'm sure you know all that, and well, it's really interesting that stimulation might, or do you at least believe that stimulation might be the underlying problem? The fact that they have no stimulation in those little, the rats have no stimulation in those cages and they take cocaine just for the stimulation. Oh yeah, that's certainly one reason why they might do that. Mm. Uh, the, the, the drive for uh, doing a lot of these things involves certain levels of, of dopamine that might be present that are abnormally low, for example, and you try to boost it up by taking Adderall or, or amphetamine. Adderall is basically amphetamine. Yeah. And so it, it's one way to get your system up to where you want it to be. Um, and I think a lot of this, uh, even, even the treatment for uh, uh, attention deficit disorder uh, involves not, you know, some people have thought of it as um, a paradoxical effect because you're taking a drug like amphetamine, a stimulant, and it seems to calm people down. Yeah. But it doesn't really calm them down. It, as you said, increases there so that they're roused and now they can focus better. And that's why they don't move around as much. They can be more focused. It's not that 
it's not that the drug has some kind of different effect on those people than it does on other people. It, it still is a stimulant. It's still having an effect on the dopamine system. But if you start out at a lower level, you're just bringing it up to where you want it to be. And so drugs like Adderall bring it up to that, to that level. And then of course, we don't have any idea what's happening to these people later when they grow up and become adults. Are they more likely to become addicted? I mean, that's certainly a possibility. And, and there's some evidence suggesting that that's the case. Mm. And I think that's an area that really should be studied a lot more because there's a lot of people taking drugs for ADD yeah. than, than you might expect. And so, but we don't follow those people up. We don't know what happens later when they're in their 30s or 40s. Are they going to be more likely to be addicted to other things like alcohol or nicotine or even cocaine or heroin or something else? Yeah, it would make logical sense too, because it seems like the problem with ADD is that they don't know how to self-stimulate, right? Their brain is low in, in terms of stimulation and they have to use, they have to rely on a, certain, a specific drug to stimulate themselves, stimulate their dopamine, yeah. their dopamine and the norepine, norepinephrine. So it wouldn't be surprising that alcohol, cocaine, all of these drugs ha also have a stimulating effect and might make them reliant on these sort of drugs. Right. Yeah. And then there are other reasons people will take the drug. I mean, alcohol, some people will take it just because uh, it makes them feel better for it helps to open them up when they go to a party or something like that, more relaxed. And, you know, and, and that's one kind of feeling. And you might get a different kind of a feeling if you're on heroin or or you're on cocaine. Uh, and so whatever floats your boat, I guess, is the way to think about that. But some people might go toward one drug or another, depending on whatever they feel like they need. Yeah, there's, there's one thing that, um, that I find super interesting, and this is more of a daily thing, you know, not in terms of heroin and cocaine, but I find that people who are less stimulated at their jobs you know, like people who are doing jobs in which they hate. And you, you've probably seen this at Indiana University. At Indiana University, I'm in the Kelly School of Business partially. And the Kelly School of Business is people who are going into accounting and finance. And the thing about accounting and finance is that nobody would go into accounting and finance if it weren't for the money, right? <laughs> like there's a good amount of money that goes into it. And people are willing to sacrifice their let's say stimulation, sacrifice their happiness, sacrifice something like enjoying their work for money. And someone, someone asked me, you know, a while ago, they're like, what is the consequence of that? And the answer that I gave them, and I want to see if this at least resonates, is that I said that it makes them more likely to become addicted to things because they are going to be dealing with low, low stimulation at their job, low dopamine, low essentially everything because they're doing something that they really don't enjoy and they're going to seek that sort of stimulation. Well, it's also possible that those types of people could take up skydiving or something like that. That would stimulate mm -hmm. their system a little bit. So maybe on weekends they could do that. <laughs> so, so, you know, they don't have to just rely on cocaine to get stimulated. There are other things they could do uh, in life that, could potentially stimulate them and get them out of that rut that they're in during the Monday through Friday routine. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the things that I noticed, and this was actually pointed out by actually a lot of the anti-capitalist um, philosophers, what they said was that, and you might find this interesting in terms of rat studies is that uh, there's this concept of once if you do some work that you hate, then it's going to completely tire you out. I think it was called the alienation of work. And what happens is when you're alienated from your work and you do something that you hate, it actually requires a lot of energy. It's very taxing. And th this is what they notice is that by the time that you come home after your work day is over, then we descend into doing things that animals would do. So we, for let's say you're working 40 hours a week, by the time you come home, you, you cease to be a human and you become an animal because, you know, what are the things that we do? We eat a lot of food. When we get home, we sit on the couch, be completely lazy, watch some television and, and well, that's pretty much it. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I want to see what you thought about that. Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, you bring up an interesting point because 
one of the treatments that have been uh, devised for some addicts is to substitute a drug with a naturally stimulating experience. Mm. So you could get addicts to, as I said earlier, go skydiving. And that gives them the rush. And that gives them the rush. And it helps to wean them off the drug. And, now, and in fact, you don't even have to take them out in an airplane and do it. You can sort of do it uh, virtually. Hmm. You know, just put goggles on and, you know, experience the whole thing. And it gives them that rush that they crave. And so they're less likely, at least in the short term, to want to go back and take a drug all of a sudden. So there are people who are developing that kind of uh, testing for potential treatment of addiction, that substituting some natural kind of form of stimulation uh, can help to uh, alleviate some cravings for drugs. Interesting. One thing that I found that was, that was well, completely related to this topic is the fact that after you do cocaine for a while, and this is something that you said in one of your studies, after you do cocaine for a while, your brain actually receives some type of damage, right? Like you receive damage to your dopamine receptors, as well as your glutamine receptors, as well as many other parts of your brain. So I would like to, well, I guess this is a better way of, of looking at it. One of, one of the things that my friends really, really, and this, this is more prominent with nicotine, is they tell me all the time, they say, I oh yeah, you know, I'm not going to get addicted to nicotine. What's the harm? And if, if the harm is really bad, then I'm just going to quit. And my argument back to them is, well, even if you get addicted for a little while and then you quit, then you're still causing more damage to your brain every single day. So I would like to, for you to give a convincer, right? A little convincer argument as to when you're taking cocaine, when you're doing yeah. nicotine, uh, what exactly is it that you're, what harm are you causing to your brain? Well, first of all, it's not even just the brain that's affected. There's all kinds of systems that are affected by these drugs. Um, your cardiovascular, for example. So mm. uh, a drug like amphetamine can increase blood pressure, increase heart rate. Uh, there are, and because it increases blood pressure, one of the things it does in the brain, even without thinking about neurons, is it interferes with blood flow through the brain. So it can actually cause many strokes. Mm. So you get, you get certain areas of the brain that are uh, where you have a rupture of the blood vessels, tiny blood vessels in the brain. And so there are areas of the brain that are now um, not getting the normal blood flow that they need. And eventually those areas will die off. I mean, and there are many cases of amphetamine addicts. Amphetamine was a big problem in the 1950s and 60s. And then it goes underground, it comes back up and it goes underground, comes back up. So there are certain waves over time. But back in the 50s and 60s, when people first started looking at amphetamine addiction closely, they found a lot of uh, brain damage, actually dead areas of the brain because mm. addicts were taking so much drug, they're influencing the blood it's true there are other things that are happening too so your receptors change i mean the brain is a plastic thing right it it, yeah. it adapts it changes based on your experiences and so if you keep taking a drug that increases dopamine for example what's the brain it's not going to sit there and say, okay i'll take all this dopamine that's coming out no, it adapts. How does it adapt? Well, the receptors for dopamine will start decreasing because you don't need as many receptors if you have all this dopamine coming out, right? Mm. Because amphetamine is promoting it or cocaine is promoting it. So your, your receptors change. You lose sensitivity in some receptors. And when you then stop taking the drug all of a sudden, you have this system where you're not releasing dopamine and your receptors are not sensitive to dopamine anymore. So it's as though you have a low level of dopamine. It's just like going back to the ADHD kid. Mm. You know, the so you, you now need stimulation. So what do you do? Well, I'll start taking a drug again. <laughs> you see, the, the changes that occur in the brain sort of 
promote or allow addiction to keep going. It becomes a vicious cycle. Neurochemically, that's the thing. Yeah. Like, like right. you know, one of the things that I find is that willpower is very difficult. And this this is probably a great transition transition into your studies on relapse. What I one of the things that I find is that people, yeah, they just kind of willpower through it. They're like, all right, I'm going to quit nicotine, for example, and I'm just going to do it. Like, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to take my jewel, throw it in the toilet, and that's that's the end of it, you know. But one of the things that they don't realize is that the the propensity for relapse is dependent upon their sensitivity and how how it's so difficult living in a world where you expect this much but you only get a lower amount you only get this much and um and yeah so tell us how you've been able to sort of figure that out with relapse well, uh, the problem with relapse your, your system is already adapted or, or expecting a drug. So you don't have it, it becomes very difficult to stay away from the drug, especially if you keep getting bombarded with signals that say, well, the drug is available now, the drug is here, all you have to do is take it. Mm -hmm. uh, it becomes very hard to, to ignore it. Uh, and and that's, that's really the problem with relapse. It, it's that your brain is already expecting the drug. Uh, the same thing happens with with heroin or or any of the opiates. Um, your system adapts. So if you're taking heroin all the time, the opioid receptors in your brain decrease. They lose their sensitivity because you don't need to have them as sensitive since you're taking a lot of opiates that are that are releasing a lot of endogenous opiates. You know the enkephalins. You've heard about them and. Yeah the brain. The brain has a lot of endogenous opiates. And so if these things are being real time, the opioid receptors go down in number, they become less sensitive. And as a result, when you stop taking the drug, you have this system where you don't have release of any of your endogenous opiates, your receptors are less sensitive. And so you're going to be more sensitive to pain, that's one of the things the opiates do is decrease pain. So if you have a low level of opiates, you're going to be more sensitive to pain. You're going to have all the other effects associated with low opiates. Uh, you're going to have fever, for example. You're not going to feel very well. You're going to feel nauseous. And so it's very easy then to go back and say, well, I don't like this. I want to take the drug. Mm -hmm. I wasn't this sick when I was on the drug. And so they go back and take the drug yeah. because the drug is sort of substituting for what you have normally in your brain. So the brain has been adapting. That's what the problem with relapse is the brain adapts to the situation. And so when you're in that situation on the drug, okay. But when you stop taking the drug, tension is going to start building up, building up, building up until you can't stand it anymore. And you go back to taking the drug. Yeah, there was there was one study that that really really got to me. It was um it was a study on a few smokers. It was done by the government, I'm pretty sure, and it was a study on a few smokers years after they after they quit successfully, right? So this is somebody who hasn't smoked in ten years, fifteen years, twenty years, and they they well asked them, well they put them in an MRI machine and they showed them pictures of of nicotine and gave them smells of smoke and all these things. And they found that throughout this time, throughout the time from, I think it was like five years to 10 years to 15 years, they had them come in multiple times. Every single time their dopamine activation, when smelling that smoke and seeing the, the stimuli were, was the same. It never changed. So for example, if you have a hundred units of dopamine, it's going to be constant throughout the entire time. The only difference and the reason why they were able to quit successfully is that every single time they did that, every single time they, um, every single time they came in, uh, successfully their prefrontal cortex actually lit up more. So from year five to year 10, they had more lighting up in the prefrontal cortex in year 10. So it seems like, and this is the unfortunate answer, is that when, when you become addicted to something, your cravings for that will never go away. It's more of, you know, your, your craving for that sensation, it will never go away. You only just need to become stronger to fight it. Right. And that, 
that's an important role for prefrontal cortex. Yeah. In fact, the same thing happens in cocaine addicts. If you look at their brain scans in an MRI machine, their prefrontal cortex is lower. The, uh, the level of activity in prefrontal cortex is lower than uh, non-addicted individuals. Hmm. So they don't have that ability to activate the prefrontal cortex to overcome whatever addiction they have. Wow. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I found that was really interesting is they did a study on Buddhist monks and Buddhist monks. They found that there was more than average activation in their prefrontal cortex. So are you, are you suggesting that making a sort of lifestyle change, like getting rid of cocaine or, or, you know, something as simple as getting rid of nicotine requires not only a simple action, but, uh, but an entire, well, restructuring of your brain. Well, your brain has to change. You have to bring it back to where you want it to be. And it takes time. I mean, and, and uh, again, it may have something to do with your background and how you're brought up, just like the rats that are in the uh, excited environment or the extended environment compared Rats that are, maybe you had better ability to drive your prefrontal cortex to activate your prefrontal cortex so you don't become addicted if you have a certain kind of background. Uh, maybe monks have a different kind of uh, background or, or ability to raise their prefrontal cortex that some other people may not. And so mm -hmm. these other people are more likely to relapse back to taking a drug again. Yeah, so that's certainly a possibility. So, so that's it. That's an interesting idea. So, what do we know? And I, I know this is outside of your realm of, of study, so you could say that this is not um, that you don't know. But what do we know about being able to increase your prefrontal cortex? Right, being able to increase the size of your pre prefrontal cortex through neuroplasticity measures. Well, uh, yeah, a lot of this is speculation, anyway. I mean. Uh, we don't have any hard evidence about how to do anything like that. Mm. Um, uh, there are certain th things you can do to activate prefrontal cortex, uh, you know, certain kinds of tasks that are more complex. It's a, it's an area of the brain that's associated with higher order cognitive kind of processes. Um, and we don't know in addicts, whether their prefrontal cortex is low to begin with, because we haven't done an MRI scan of someone who hasn't been addicted yet. Hmm. You know, we don't have that kind of information. We, we might have the information after they become addicted, mm -hmm. but we don't know what their prefrontal cortex was doing before that. And so maybe it was low in the first place and that allowed them to become addicted, or maybe not. We don't know that. We know that a prefrontal cortex, if you can build it up and activate it after addiction, maybe you can prevent relapse. Mm. But maybe the problem lies somewhere else and the prefrontal cortex activation is just helping to overcome that other problem. You see yeah. what I'm saying? We, mm -hmm. we just don't know that because you don't, you don't have the luxury of studying an addict before he becomes addicted. We don't know who's going to become addicted before they're addicted. And so we don't have that kind of background information. That's why, you know, rats are useful because we can control rats. We can look at them before we expose them to the drug and look at them after we expose them to the drug. But as I said, rats live in a relatively simple environment or a simple thing. And so, you know, they don't have issues like peer pressure. They don't have issues like, uh, well, I'm watching TV and I see all these ads about alcohol and I want to start taking alcohol like people do. And so it, it, it's a difficult kind of a problem. And that's one of the reasons why addiction is so difficult to study and to treat. Yeah. It seems like a lot of the problems are correlational, right? And human yeah. and everything's correlational. I thought one of the things that was really interesting is in one of your studies, you found that stress actually decreases the prefrontal cortex in, in uh, prefrontal cortex activity in rats. And I think that's, that's super interesting because when we think about relapse, a lot of the relapse actually comes from stress. Exactly, yeah. Stress is one of the factors that drives relapse, just like cues can drive relapse. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, cues associated with the drug. Stress is another thing that can drive relapse. And stress uh, is also 
manifest in prefrontal cortex. So stress has an effect on the development or the uh, uh, eventual uh, uh, structural uh, aspect of neurons in prefrontal cortex. Stress can alter synaptic connections in prefrontal cortex. Stress can alter the extent of dendritic connections mm -hmm. between neurons in prefrontal cortex. So stress is another big factor. Uh, and then that opens up a whole nother problem because there's all different kinds of stress. Yeah. <laughs> you know, some, for some people, certain things can be stressful and other people, those same things may not be stressful. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's, it's really hard to narrow and, and make a uh, definitive statement about it. You can look at it in rats and you can stress rats in various ways. Uh, you can put them in a chamber where you don't, where they don't, where they can't move for a couple of hours. So they're sort of locked Mm -hmm. That's a stressful situation for a rat. Um, you can shock them. That's another stressful situation for a rat. But what's the equivalent in humans? Yeah. yeah. It's difficult to know. So we may be able to prevent addiction in rats, but we're a long way from preventing addiction in, in people because uh, it's, a, it's a complicated process. And the other thing, too, that you have to keep in mind is that a lot of the work being done in addiction is funded through the government. You don't have a lot of private companies trying to study addiction mm -hmm. because there's no real financial incentive for them to study. Um, I mean, what kind of financial incentive do you have? I mean, you know, most addicts aren't very rich. <laughs> I mean, they're not gonna, they're not, they're not gonna be wanting to take a, a hundred dollar pill to get rid of their addiction they'll rather just take the drug or whatever it is yeah and so you don't have a lot of research being devoted to addiction except what's provided by the government different from what we have for a lot of drugs for uh, depression or uh, schizophrenia or other kinds of diseases or even a vaccine for a virus there's a lot of financial incentives to develop that kind of stuff but you don't have it for addiction. And so that's one of the reasons addiction research kind of lags behind other things. Mm, that's kind of annoying. I also find that it's a somewhat taboo topic. You know, when, when you sit there and you talk about addiction, it's like, well, an addict doesn't like to talk about their own addiction, right? Like, you know, if you, if you talk to someone about their cocaine addiction, they're going to be like, stop talking to me. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. It's bothering me. So it seems like there's also a problem facilitating conversation in that area too. Yeah, there's a lot of problems associated with that. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I, I don't think we're 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 going to be very close to solving the addiction problem, um, but every little step helps. So we know more now than we did 20 years ago. We know a little bit more now about how individual drugs work, and so eventually, I think we'll get there. But it's going to take a long time. It's not going to be something that's going to be solved overnight. Yeah, no, that's that's well, that's hopeful. And I just wanted to end this. So I just want to end this uh, call with one last question. And I think this is something that um that is really well practical. A good way to end it is: Do you have any practical advice for people who are, you know, potentially, let's say, someone going into college because you deal with college students? Do you have any practical advice for people as they start to? enter the world of dopamine and drugs and all of these things? Well, I don't know. I guess uh, the most important thing is to uh, try to stay true to yourself and uh, don't necessarily fall for whatever comes along. You know, try to be resilient and, and focus on what you're able to do and control for yourself. It's, it's important to, to maintain your own control rather than let it go to someone else and let them determine what you're going to do, you know, whether you're going to take this or take that, you know, you have to stand yourself at some point and say, no, I don't want to do this. Some people are going to be, it's going to be easier for some people to do that than others. I mean, it's, it's a difficult kind of a thing, but it, it again, depends on how you're brought up and, and how you're thinking, try to be independent and try to live your own life and uh, don't uh, knuckle into whatever comes along and you know, yeah. stand, stand firm in what, what you believe. It, it's not easy to do. I understand that. 
<laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's a difficult thing. Addiction is is something that's that's a problem. It's not just drugs. It, you could be addicted to uh, other gambling. You could be addicted to other kinds of things too. So it's not it's not just drugs. But I'm guessing the same kind of circuitry in the brain is involved. Yeah, because it's all part of the same system. It, it's all part of your motivational system. We all want to do something, whether we want to eat, you know, you get hungry, you want to eat, you get thirsty, you want to drink. And so that's all part of your motivational system. And, and that motivational system is the one that's vulnerable to whatever these drugs can do. Mm. Interesting. And it's, it's difficult to, uh, to try to interfere with that. So you have to try and uh, stand up on your own two feet and, do whatever you can as an individual and maintain your own self-control. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's, no, I think that's a great lesson. I mean, what you, what you've been essentially saying is, and this, this is what we've been talking about is the, the answer sort of lies in the prefrontal cortex. The answer lies with your logical thinking brain, the one that, you know, gives you that sort of self-control. And yeah, it's, it's the cortex, but the cortex interacts with so many other parts of the brain too. It's not all just one part. It's just like it's not all dopamine, it's not all prefrontal cortex, it's, it's how everything talks to everything else. So you have a lot of circuits in the brain, and that's one of the areas the research is going now is through circuits. It's not just one part of the brain, it's how that part of the brain connects to other parts of the brain and how that circuitry plays a role in driving behavior. So it's, it's, it's an entire circuit, it's, it's a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, it's definitely the brain is known for being. If it was easy, we would have we would have figured it out a long time ago. If it was easy, <laughs> so there's still a way to go in trying to solve the problem of addiction. Yeah, well, you know what? Thank thank you for doing your work because, well, uh, I'm happy that we're getting closer. So yeah, well, thanks for this. I'm I enjoyed it. It's it's good to talk about these things. Yeah, and no, I appreciate having you on, and um, you have a great day. Okay, thank you. You too.